uh, parash, parasha over here, right? The next, uh, which is Vayaram. So over here, this is already after the Brit Milav was done on Avram Avinu. And uh, now we find him in the recovery stage of the Brit Milav. You know, it takes a few days to recover, whatever. So they say in the Chazal, by the way, something interesting. They say that uh, when you do some kind of surgery, any kind of cut, whatever, cutting, so it takes, as we said, right, some time to recover, but there's a certain time which is like the worst time, which is the person is most vulnerable, physically speaking, you know, which is the third day after the surgery. Let's say the third day is the most dangerous time. So uh, this is exactly what we find over here, that on the third day after his uh, Mila was done, he was sitting there right in the, it was a very hot day. And they say, right, that there wasn't a coincidence that it was a hot day, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it especially hot that day. What's the reason why? Because he didn't want there should be any guests coming, you know, to, to bother Abraham. Because Abraham Avinu was very much, uh, you know, valuing, valuing the uh, mitzvah of Hanasat Orchim, of taking in guests. So he was always looking to take in guests, and he used to stand right, uh, sit outside his uh, home, his tent, and uh, he used to look for, for, for uh, travelers over there that he, should be, he could take in, give them food, give them drinks, you know, teach them some uh, some prayers, teach them some Torah, teach them to uh, right and let them stay there for the night as well. You know, to lodge all these things. Right, he allowed them to do, and this was uh, his uh, favorite uh, mitzvah, right? As we know, um, so uh, it says right that the Kadosh Baruch Hu made it especially hot. That there should be nobody passing by. Nobody would have the right the the audacity to pass by on a hot day like that. But what happened was that Avraham Avinu still. Right, even with because he was in pain after the third day of after, after the milah, the pain was great, and he was very vulnerable, but still and very weak. But still, he's sitting there, out there looking for people, even though it was very hot. He said, maybe somebody will come and pass by and so forth, so on. You know. So what happened was that uh, in the end, Kadosh uh, Baruch Hu brought him three angels that came there because. Right? Um, uh, these angels had a job to do, by the way. They didn't come there just uh, for no reason. So, uh, as the Chazal say, right, that the angel, when he comes to this world to do a certain job, he comes only for that job, and then he has to, he leaves. That's it. You know, that's no, he doesn't stay around there just to have you know to have a, have a good time or enjoy himself, whatever. He just does the job and goes. That's it. So what happened was that these three angels that came to the Avraham Avinu that day, every one of them had a job. Okay. Uh, so what was the job? The job was, number one, that the first uh, angel came to uh, tell Sarah Imenu that she, now she was going to have a child. Right? This was the time now she was going to get pregnant and have a child and so forth and so on. Uh, that was the first angel. second angel was sent, according to the Chazal, to turn over, overturn Saddam and Amorah, you know, these uh, wicked cities, right, uh, over there in, the, in that area that they were living in. They were very close by over there. So uh, what happened was that they came, one of them came to do that. that. That was a job that he came to do. And the third one also came for a different job, which was to save Lot. What happened with Lot? Lot was over there living in, in, in Sodom. Right? And therefore, he uh, since the city was going to be destroyed, he needed somebody to get him out of there, yank him out, and this way he wouldn't get killed. So these three angels came for that purpose. That's what they came for. Uh, but they also serve now an alternative purpose, which was what? To give Avram Avinu a chance to do, you know, harasat orchim, to do, to do, take in guess. So what's the story over here? The story is that uh, these angels, they came disguised as men. You know, they came disguised as like, you know, uh, Arabs, basically. So what does that mean? That means that uh, Avram Avinu didn't know they were angels. That's what it means. So he sees them, spots them, you know, he runs, starts to run through, towards them. And uh, the Pasuk says like this, right? And we said, right, the Pasuk says that it was very, very hot, extremely hot that day. And now, so what happened? He goes over there, runs over there to greet them, and he uh, bows down to them too, right? Uh, so meaning what? He treated them with, with uh, you know, the utmost respect. Not because they look like, you know, angels, because they just, you know, he, he, did, he treated everybody with respect like that. 
That's the way he was. You know, he was a humble man. He was a man that that knew that having this kind of attitude towards people brings them closer. You know, so he was able to uh, to bring the, the key roof. You know, to 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 bring people closer to Hashem by treating them with tremendous you know respect, even respect that they didn't really deserve, right? more than they deserved. So uh, it says in the next pasuk. Uh, so now it's an interesting thing, right? This pasuk, it says like this, right? That he says to them, he uses the word Adonai, right? So, you know, usually when we say that word, that means that it's a name of God, right? So uh, the question is, why does he use this word to greet these uh, angels? You know, he didn't know that they were angels. So you can't say that he was calling them... Uh, you know this name because he knew they were angels is not true. So then, why did they uh, why did they call him this name? Um, so to do this right in Chazal, there's two opinions regarding this. One says that this name is saying what? It's really like this, right? In the Hebrew language, Adon means uh, master, right? So if you want to say my master, you say Adoni, my master, right? If you want to say in plural, three people here we're talking about three angels. So you say Adonai, that's the way it says, you understand? So meaning what? That the word Adonai can also be used to, to my masters. You understand? That's what it literally means, that the word. Yeah. yeah. Okay? So uh, that's a machloket, it's a dispute in the Chazal, whether this word is talking about my masters, meaning what? That you, my guests, he's to- talking to them. There's also another opinion that says no. Masters, uh-huh. masters. I'm sorry? Masters, uh, Georgian, how uh, like Someone above standing above you? Or? Right, right. Somebody above you, somebody you know, you respect. You know, you know it's master, right? Like, uh, but you, have, you have a slave, right? person who's a slave? Baton, you know? baton. Baton, yeah, right, right, exactly, exactly. That's it, baton, yeah, that's it. So, Chemi uh, Baton Ebi, you know? So, um, that's what he told them. But there's also another opinion, which says that what? That he wasn't really saying here, he wasn't talking to them. This says that he was talking to somebody else over here, he was talking to Hashem. You understand? So two different ways of understanding this pasuk. So according to the, the first meaning that we mentioned, right, he was talking to, the, to these angels, he thought, that he thought that they were men. So he's telling them, right, my masters, you know, don't pass by, you know, stay with me. You know, come in and, uh, you know, be my guest. That's one explanation. But according to the second meaning, right, which he's talking to Hashem, so then what is, he, what is he saying over here? What he's saying is like this, right? That Hashem at that time came to speak with him. So he was dwelling with, with, with Hashem. You know, uh, Avraham Avinu. And they say, by the way, that, uh, that uh, the, the reason Hashem came to visit him that day was because he was on the third day after the Milah. So as we said, right, he's a sick. So it's considered to be a sick person. So it's a mitzvah bikur cholim. He did bikur cholim for Hashem. Did bikur cholim from Avraham. He visited a sick person, you know, in the hospital, whatever. This wasn't a hospital, but the same idea. So uh, what, he, what we're saying is that, uh, according to this meaning, what he says is like this, right? He says, you know what? I want to go and grab those guests. So can you, you know, Adonai, you know, can you, Hashem, can you wait, wait for me, you know, because you know I gotta go and do mitzvah, and then I'll come back to you. <laughs> That's what he was telling me. That's it. That's the end. Don't go away. Stay right here. That's what he was telling us to Hashem. Uh, so from here, by the way, we learn a very interesting uh, concept that's brought down in Talmud. Talmud says that uh, from here we learn an amazing uh, principle. What's the amazing principle? That taking in guests to your home is greater than wel- welcoming the Shekhinah, right? What does that mean? That when you welcome a Shekhinah, that's like the divine presence, right? The Hashem's presence, the presence of Hashem in the world. You want to welcome that into your abode, to your home, or to your place, wherever you are. It's greater to take in guests than to, than, than, than to, to take in the Shekhinah. So where, where, do we learn, where do we learn that from? From here. Why? Because he left Hashem in order to go get the guests. So we see from here that this was greater. That's, that's, what, the, that's what the Chazal say. So it's an amazing thing, right? You see the value of taking in guests. It's an amazing, amazing mitzvah. Uh, by the way, you know, it uh, doesn't always apply this thing. You know, some people think, you know, t- just taking in guests for no reason, you know. For, it means that they need, uh, you know, they need that, and they need a meal, they need somewhere to lodge, they need a place to sleep. 
They need that, then you know you're doing a service to them, right? either either to, either to either to you know because they have nowhere else to go, or because you want to teach them some Torah, you want to teach them about Shabbat, how Shabbat is, how to do Shabbat, and all the beauty of Shabbat, all these things. So if you invite them, they'll learn what Shabbat means. They never saw it before in their life Shabbat what it means. So now you invite them in, right? So that's considered to be a greater mitzvah in a case like that than uh, than being with Hashem. That's that's how great it is. Okay, let's go on. So it says, right, that um, So it tells them, you know what, let's take a little water, right? It says, wash your feet, because they used to walk barefoot, you know, in those times. Or they were walking with like these open sandals, whatever it is, you know? So their feet were dirty, you know, from the, from the, from the dirt that was on the floor. It, was, it wasn't pavement like we have today, you know, betoni, you know, it's not like that. It was like, you know, dirt, dirt, dirt floor. So because of that, their, their feet were always getting dirty when they were traveling. And this is the reason why uh, he tells them, right, wash your feet. By the way, the Chazal also says something, a deeper meaning over here, which is what? That these, you know, they had a custom in those days, these Arabs that used to walk around in that, that area, that they used to worship the dust on their feet, meaning it was some kind of avodazara. So therefore, Avraham Avinu, what he meant to tell them was, you know what, wash off that dust on your feet because I don't want to bring avodazara into my home. This, this was a different explanation also, right? The more deeper explanation of why he told them to wash his feet, wash their feet before he t- lets them come in. He says, first, wash your feet because I don't want this stuff in my house, you know, this idolatry. I'm not interested in having that in my house. That's the reason why he was uh, the right? He was he was very makpid. He was very careful about that. washing the feet also, so like you, when you, like in writing dress, this was washing feet was one of the things. It was, yeah. It was like a ritual kind of thing, right? In order to, you know, make them comfortable, right? Make them comfortable and, you know, have a, have a, you know, have a clean, right? The, have a clean thing in the situation, uh, as you said, right? Um, Okay. <laughs> so getting back to where we were right uh, we said that uh, he tells them uh, by the way there's a, a fundamental question here which needs to be answered before we go on which is how you know when when these angels came to visit Avram Avinu why did they come in the form of men that's, that's you know a fundamental question uh, why you know because angels don't look like this they, they don't you know they, the Chazal tell us right the angels don't look like people they have a different form their body is a different right they have the wings and they have also one leg instead of two they have one it's like ah, united yeah, one right one leg and wings and all kinds of things like this so therefore you know the question is uh why all of a sudden now did they come in the form of a man you know what's the reason why they did that so uh, the zohar explains by the way uh, this this idea in a deep manner right? in, a, in a deep way it says right that when uh, a spiritual entity comes into this world like an angel it has to be clothed with some kind of earthly clothing, right? Some kind of earthly covering. So everything that comes in here to the, into this world has to have some kind of a body, some kind of a earthly, you know, appearance. So therefore, the angels, when, when they come here, they have to look like, you know, like something normal. They can't look like something out of this world, you know, something that will, will not fit into this world. This world has its own rules and laws, you know, the laws of nature, you know, as we, as we call it, right? There's laws of nature. So when you, since you have in this world laws of nature, these laws cannot be broken 
you know, for anybody who just uh, decides to come in here, you know, and uh, he's not, he cannot change the way this world looks and appears. And this is the reason why uh, the angels had to come as men, you know, with a normal body and everything. Um, and by the way, this is the reason why also we, you know, human beings, we are, really, what is a human being? What, what is a, it's, it's, it's a neshama, it's a soul. But we also have a body, right? So the question is, what's the real you? Is it the body, the real you, or is it the soul? The soul is the real you. So then why do you need a body? Because when you come into this world, you need the physical clothing. That's the, way, that's the way it is, you know? So everything that comes here needs a physical clothing. That's the way it is. You cannot come in here just, you know, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, wind. Some's coming come in as a wind. You have to come in as something real, something tangible. Uh, by the way, the same thing also applies to the Torah itself. Right? That we have, you know, the Torah over here we have in the, in the, in the Teva. But the question is, is that really the Torah that, the, you know, it's just that really the truth is it's, a, it's, it's clothing for the Torah. And what we have, that's the outer clothing for the Torah. There's also the inner Torah, you know, which is not something physical, right? It's something, it's something spiritual. But since it comes into this world, the Torah, it also has to have a physical clothing. And this is the physical clothing that it has, right? The, the, the way it's written with the letters and so forth and so on. And, you know, these stories that, which are there and all these things, that, all these simple, you know, uh, stories that are written there. All these things uh, are, are, are the physical clothing of the Torah. But the truth is, right, in the Zohar it says that uh, even these letters, by the way, as you, uh, as you may have heard, even if one letter is missing, right, from the Sefer Torah, it's pasul, it's not kosher. One letter is missing, or it's scratched or something, whatever, you know, blotted out, whatever. It's not kosher. So the question is, why is that? What's the reason why one letter throws everything off? So the answer is, is because uh, the Zohar says that the, the, the Torah, every letter of the Torah, is crucial for the existence of the world. You know, even, even if one letter is not there, it's like the whole world doesn't exist. So therefore, it's not really a Torah anymore. It also says another thing, which is what? That the, the, the Torah, all the letters of the Torah, are one long name of, of, of God. Can you imagine? The whole Torah, from being to end, from Bereshit Bresh, to, to Devarim, is one name of God. Can I ask a story? Very important. Just so. Hello. 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 Sorry. So, so sorry. I'm 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 sorry. So, uh, let's go on. So it says, right, by Kapat Lechem the Sanduri Bechem Achar Tabo, Kia Ken Avartem Al Abdechem, the Muru Ken Tase Kasher di Barta. So we see from here that the Pasuk tells us that he promised him now, all these guests, right, he tells them, listen, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of bread, you know, something, a piece of bread to eat, whatever, have a, have a seat, relax. But in the end, he wound up giving them a lot more. He gave, he gave them. Uh, as we as we were going to see, right? He gave them uh, butter and cream, and he gave them a meat to eat and a really nice meal. So if that's the case, why did he only tell them that he was going to give them uh, just a little bit of bread? So from here, the Chazal learned an important principle, right? Which is what? That tzaddik, a person who's a tzaddik, a person who's righteous, he says, he promises you a little bit, but he does a lot. He does a lot more. And this is the example of Avraham Avinu, right? That what he told them, I'm going to give you a little piece of bread. But then why is it winds up giving up the, give them, giving them a, a five star meal? Uh, on the other hand, right, they say that the Rasha, the person who's wicked, he promises you the whole world, but in the end he won't give you anything. That's the way it is, right? So you see a person's character by the way he uh, fulfills his word, right? Does he give you more than he told you, or does he give you less than he told you? Let's go on. So he says. So it says, right, that Abraham now comes to his wife, and he tells him, you know, in a hurry, right, start making the food, right, because we have guests coming in, make some, uh, make some bread, make some uh, food to eat, uh, so he starts to tell her, right, uh, to, to give her, to, to, to prepare the meal. So he also gave, uh, right, to, to his son, Ishmael, he wanted to train him to do mitzvot, you know, so he wanted to train him to do mitzvot of, of taking in guests. And this is, by the way, until this day, you should know that the Ishmaelim, 
they have this custom of taking in guests. You know, it's a big thing by them. If you come to their house, they always, you know, treat you with a lot of respect. What's the reason why? Because since Avram Avinu trained his son Ishmael right, to do the mitzvah of Al-Khanas that he very much wanted to involve him with this mitzvah, so uh, from there he learned that it's a very, very important and crucial thing, and therefore he also was participating in this, and until this day, by the way, the Ishmaelim hold this tradition that, uh, that we find over here. Uh, by the way, there's an interesting story regarding that. Mm-hmm. They say, right, that what happened, that, you know, there, there comes, later on we're going to see that Abraham Aminu throws out Ishmael, right, because he's being a bad boy, he's not behaving properly, so forth, so on, we're going to get to that some other time. But the point is that once he threw him out, you know, with his mother and so forth, so on, but he still was going once in a while to check up on him, you know, to see how he's doing. He wanted to see if he's progressing, you know, if he's did tshuva, you know, also to give him some, some pointers, some hints, you know, some, uh, some advice, how to be a good boy, stay out of trouble, so forth, so on. So they say, right, that one time he went out of his way, all the way to visit him, you know, uh, he lived very far away. So he went to visit him, and uh, he comes there to his house. So what happens is that he, you know, rings the doorbell, and so forth, so on. So uh, he's not home. So who's home? His wife was home, you know. So uh, they say, right, that... Um, when he saw that uh, Avram came, when she saw that, so she asks him, you know, who are you? You know, this and that. So he says, I'm his father, your, your husband's father, you know, father, your father-in-law. So she didn't invite him in, you know, to, to eat something, to drink, all this, you know, whatever. She didn't really uh, give him anything. So by that, Avraminu saw that she wasn't really a good lady, you know, a good lady wouldn't do such a thing like that, to send somebody away without giving them something to drink, something to eat, whatever. So because of that, what he did was, he left a message, you know, for, uh, for Ishmael. <laughs> Ishmael wasn't there. So what was the message that he left for, uh, for Ishmael? He said, you know what, he leaves, that, he leaves a message, by the way, with his wife, even though she doesn't know what he's talking about. So he tells his wife like this, tell my son Ishmael a message from me, that I came to visit him, and... What I take, what I say is, he says, he says, I, he says the uh, the foundation to your to your door, right? The door, with the hinges of your door are very, they're broken. He says you got to fix your door. Something something is wrong there with your with with your door. So you know when he came home, Ishmael and his wife told him this this message that we got from Avram. So what he understood what, what there was there was there was a hidden meaning there the, regarding this, right? What was the hidden meaning? The meaning, hidden meaning was that your wife is not a good person. You know, she doesn't take in guests. She's not very, you know, hospi- hospitable. So therefore, you should divorce her and get a different wife. You know, this is not a good wife for you. So what he did was, he understood the, the implication. He divorced her. You know, he divorced this lady. And he got another wife. You know, uh, he married a different lady. So what happened was that, uh, once again, Avram Avinu, you know, uh, went and uh, to visit him again. So again, the same thing happens, right? He's not home. Right? He's always out. You know, he was always out in the field, this guy. He was a man of the field. So he, he wasn't home. So this time, you know, the wife that he sees now gives him, you know, gives him to eat and drink, everything, you know, nice hospitality. So Avram Avinu, after he sees, you know, that she's a good lady, this lady, so he tells also a message to her, you know, he says, give a message to my son. What's the message? He says, oh, the message is that, you know, the, he says, the foundation to your door now, it's very, it's very stable, you know, very solid. Don't change the door, you know. That's what he tells him, you know. So when, when he comes home again, Ishmael, he hears from his wife, it's another message also. And he understood what he meant was that the wife is good, you know, this, this lady is a good lady. So this, uh, uh, so uh, we see from here, right, that what? That uh, the, uh, the, uh, the of hospitality, of Hachnasat Rochim was a very, very central issue in the house of Avraham Avinu with his children and so forth and so on, right? It was something which was the, you know, the basic, you know, the, the foundation of the, of the home. That's what it was, basically, by them. So, uh, by the way, we have, to, until this day, you know, some very good Jews who also do this kind of thing, you know? The Baruch Hashem, Hashem has blessed them with, you know, with the wealth, you so, know, they have a nice home, they have a big home, everything, whatever, so they invite people for Shabbat, you know, and they make people feel good, and they bring them close to Hashem, they bring them close to Torah, it's a nice thing, you know, so you until this say, day, we have, uh, yeah. You could say that that one is more than, like, hospitality, more than, in, like, Ten Commandments? Well, it, we're not going to say that, right? Because really, that really, because apart, Hashem is also there, right? Right, so right, right, exactly. But you know, yeah. what, what, we're not going to say it that far because yeah. the Ten Commandments really includes the whole Torah. You know what I'm saying? It includes everything, including this mitzvah as well. Mm. The Ten Commandments, there's hints there, allusions, right, to all the 613 mitzvot that we have in the Torah. Uh-huh. 
That's the way it is. You know what I mean? So the Ten Commandments really includes everything. Uh, so it's, it's really impossible to say that it's more important than Ten Commandments because it's really a part of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. You know what I mean? The, the, to bring in people and so forth and so on, to bring in guests. But what we are saying is that it's, it was really, you know, by Avram Avinu, this was like the foundation of his home. So, you know, that's, that's why he was also interested in training his children because he wanted to pass on this tradition to, to his offspring as well, right? To his family. Uh, okay, so let's go on. So it says, So now, right, they start to gain down the business over here. Right? Uh, what's the business? The business is, they came to do their job, right? They didn't come here to eat. I mean, so, you know, so th- then the question is, why did they eat? Because they wanted to make him feel good, you know, that, uh, he, you know, he, he wanted, he loved to doing the mitzvah, mitzvah, so therefore they wanted to make him feel good. They ate, but they didn't really need to eat. Angels don't need to eat. They don't, they don't have any, any, any issue to eat, right? But, uh, the point is that now that they did eat, so, uh, they made him feel better. By the way, the Chazal also learned something from here as well. That what? That we find also that the angels came to Lot, right, later on, to save him, as we said, right? One of the angels came for that reason. So, but when you find that they came to Lot to save him, Lot also invited them in to eat with them, you know, these people, because he also thought they were, they were people. So what happened was, though, that even though he invited them in to eat, but they refused, you know? Why did they refuse? So they say the Chazal, right? Why is it that with Avraham Avinu, they didn't refuse, they, they accepted, they ate. And when it comes to Lot, they didn't want to eat. So the difference is because Avraham Avinu was a tzaddik, he was a big man, he was, a, you know, Adam Gadol. So since he was a big man, they say, right, you're not allowed to refuse a big man, you know, something who's a, who's a tzaddik. You're not allowed to refuse him, you know, you should do his will. Because when he does something, he means, it's, you know, it's something very important what he, what he's doing. It's not just something, you know, for social reasons, you know, just to have a good time, you know, have a, have a, you know, KP, you know, like a little, you know, party, whatever. It's not the reason when a tzaddik tells you to do something, he, he knows what he's telling you, right? He knows that something, something which is important, something which is crucial, something which is, uh, which is a mitzvah, something which is going to uplift you, right? And elevate you. So therefore, that's, that's the reason why when it comes to a tzaddik, right? They say, don't refuse what he tells you, right? If he invites you to do something, go do it with him, you know, because he knows what he's telling you and it's good for you it's good for him it's good for everybody but if it's come, it comes to a person who's not a tzaddik so why do, why do I care you know the, why should I eat by him you know I have no reason to, to you know if I'm not hungry if I'm, I, don't, I don't want to eat I'm not going to eat what, what, uh, you know, why should I listen to him there's no reason to there's no reason to, to, to accommodate his, his wishes that's what they say right uh, so now they come right to do the business what's the business so they come in, uh, the first one as we said right came to tell Sarah Menu that she's going to have a child so right away, right? What does he? What does he ask? He says, "Where is your wife? Where is Sarah Ishtecha? Right? Where? Where is she? Uh, where is she located? You know, we don't see her over here. Where? Where? Where is she? So, uh, why did they ask uh, him this question? They knew where she was. They're angels, right? They're supposed to know everything. So the question is, if that's the case, why? You know, why are they asking him this question? So the truth is, right? They say the Chazal that they wanted to endear her to him. What does that mean? That he was going to say what? What's the answer? That she's in the tent, right? She's inside the house. She's not hanging around the street. So that's a good thing, right? That a woman, they say, a woman is a Jewish woman, is supposed to be tzanua. Right? What does it mean tzanua? Tzanua means that she's supposed to be, you know, in the home, not going out and, you know, hanging around the street. Because we know, right, when women hang around, hang around outside, they get into trouble. So uh, as we saw, right, with the case of Dina, and also many other things that happen to, to all kinds of women, right, that we've seen. The, usually, usually the biggest problem is that they're always, you know, outside the home, and that's what gets them, gets them into trouble. Uh, so what, what, what they wanted to do is endear her to him. What does that mean? To remind him, oh, you know, my wife is Tanua, you know, she's not hanging around in the street, she's inside the home. So this way, you know, it'll make him feel good about her. You know what I mean? So uh, that's, why, that's why he, uh, he, uh, he said this. Uh, they, they told him this. They asked him this question. So he answers them, Hineba Ho, right? She's in the tent. So, okay, now she's in the tent. So now the, the angels say, So it says, right, that what? That um, next year it says, I'll come to you, back to you, right? And you're Door, your wife, Sarah, is going to have a son. Right? And she was listening to this. What does that mean? That she was eavesdropping, you know, from the tent, you know, she was like, you know, got to listen with, with her ear. Right? And then it says in the next pasuk, Abraham and Sarah, Zekenim, Ba'im, Ba'yamim, Chadal, Liot, V'Sarah, Orach, Kenashim. And then it says, V'Titzchak, Sarah, Bekir, Ba, Lemo, Achere, Beloti, Haita, Li, Edna, V'Adoni, Zaken. So you know what? She was like amazed by this, right? All of a sudden she hears she's going to have a child. So she says, wait a second, but you know, 
uh, the Pasuk reminds us over here that what? She already wasn't having her menstruation. She was already in menopause, you know, for, for quite a long time. So if that's the case, how am I going to have children? She was very, you know, surprised by this, very shocked. So because of that, she kind of like laughed, you know, she said like, come on, this sounds ridiculous, you know, kind of like, she mocked it a little bit, you know, she, she was under like a state of shock, what, what is that, I'm going to have a child now, I'm already an old lady, you know, with wrinkles and everything, I'm all wrinkled and everything, so how am I going to, how am I going to have a child now at this, at this point, so what happened was, that this didn't find favor with the, with the angels, you know, because they heard her that she wasn't so much, she was in disbelief, that's, that's what she, it means, yeah. No, Sarah was questioning how she... Right, exactly. Abraham, lama ze tzachaka Sarah lemor ha'af umnam elet v'ani zakanti? So what happened was, right, but now, Hashem asks uh, to Abraham, why is your wife laughing? Right, what is this, a, what is this, a joke? They caught on to this, you know what I mean? So what's, what's, what's going on here? What, she's laughing? What's there to laugh about over here? Uh, so, meaning what? That this was something which was beneath her dignity, you know, that uh, a woman like this, who, who was a prophetess, you know, this lady, she was a very righteous woman. How is it that a woman like this on her level should, you know, mock the, this kind of a thing and, you know, laugh about it as if it's a joke? So, this didn't find favor in the eyes of, of, of Hashem. So, what happened was that, uh, So, he says, right, that is there anything which is difficult for Hashem? Hashem can do anything, you know? So what, you're all way, Hashem could break, break, take you back in time and make you young again. What, you don't know that? Uh, is there something which is difficult for Him? Nothing is difficult for Him. Everything is possible for Him. So He says, I'm going to come back to you next year and you're going to have a son. That's what He tells them. So Sarai of Nainu, she heard this, you know, complaint. You know, she overheard this too. So she answered to this complaint. What was her answer? What techachesh Sarah alemo lo tzachakti ki so, you know, she tried to deny it. She said, no, no, I didn't laugh. You know, she lied about it. She didn't say the, say the truth, right? But, you know, the, the, uh, the angel answered, you know, wait a second, you did laugh. You know, but you did. So, meaning what, that the angel, you know, put her in her place. She, uh, you know, he, uh, he told her, he told her the truth. You know, why, why, are you, why are you trying to trick me? I know, I know the truth that you lied, that you, that you, uh, that, that you laughed. Uh, so, by the way, from here, this is a very important principle over here. Because, you know, in the, in the halakha, in the Jewish law, we have a rule which says that uh, a woman is not believed in beddin, in court. She can't be a witness. A uh, woman, no? Yeah, what does that mean? Let's say you have a monetary case against somebody, right? Money, money matter. Right? Some kind of financial dispute. So you can't bring witnesses as women. You know, women cannot be witnesses. Still same thing, yeah, same thing. So you also can't bring a witness, you know, for a woman cannot be witness for a capital case, a murder case, something like that, whatever, all these things, you know. Up to the, today. Sure. Today, yeah. According to the Jewish law, that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. So um, the question is why? I mean, you know, why would you think that a woman, what, that all women are liars? What's, what's the reason why? Why would you think that a woman is not going to tell the truth? about these things, about, you know, you owe somebody money, or, you know, there's some, or somebody killed somebody, all these things. Um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very strong question. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really say, in the halakha, by the way, why that is, mm-hmm. what, the, what the reason is. But it seems to me, to be honest with you, that, that we learn it from here. Mm-hmm. Because uh, the truth is, right, that in, there are some things that women are believed in. As, as I said, right, there's two things that women are not believed. Capital cases... And monetary cases, right? They're not believed in. Things like this, they're not believed. But when it comes to other things, they are believed, right? What we call that in halakha yisurim, right? What does that mean? Prohibitions. When it comes to prohibitions, they are believed. For instance, let's say, you know, you go to a woman's house, right? She tells you, listen, you know, this meat is kosher, don't worry, you know? So we believe her or no? She's a liar? No, we believe her. What about if your wife, right, uh, went to the mikveh, right? You come home, she comes home, right? And she tells you, I went to the mikveh. You believe her? Or you're gonna you gotta, gotta call the mikvah and they find out maybe she didn't go, you know. So you do believe her, right? So the question is why, uh, you know. So the answer is that when it comes to prohibitions, we do believe the women. So when when do we not believe the women when it comes to uh, monetary cases and and and, and uh, capital cases? In these cases, we don't. But when it comes to Yisurim, things which are prohibitions, we do believe them. So the question is why? If you tell me that the woman is a liar, so she's a liar in everything, you know. So don't believe her in anything. 
If you tell me that she's honest, she's also honest over here. What's the difference between this and that? That's the question. So the answer is that uh, we see from here the answer. The answer is because it says, right, why did she lie over here, Sarah and Mabel? Why did she lie? Yeah, why, why didn't you just say the truth? You know, I left. Okay, I'm sorry, you know. What, what's the reason why? So the Pasuk says, right, Ki area, she, was, she was afraid. Afraid. Yeah. Afraid of what? She was afraid of the the embarrassment of it or, you know, the uh, the punishment. From Hashem? Or she from got Hashem? fear. Yeah, she got fear from this, you know. She had a fear. You know, it just, it's something which, you know, women have, have a tendency to sometimes be afraid of things. You know? Uh... What does that mean? When they see some kind of a threat, some potential threat, you know, they will lie readily to avoid that, you know, threat, physical threat. They will do that. Physical threat. Yes. So, same thing happens over here, you understand? What, that's exactly what we're seeing over here. That the reason why she lied was because she was she felt that there was a threat here, you know, to her, to her, to her well-being, whatever it is, you know, to her, to her life, whatever it is. That's the reason why she lied. So, uh, just for herself or the whole whole family? No, it was her problem. You know, it wasn't somebody else's problem. She was, like she did that, right? He didn't do anything. He didn't do anything wrong. So, no, whenever yeah. she feels afraid of something happens with her, yeah. or whole family. Like yeah, she also lie lie for her family as well. Sure, sure, sure. That's that. Yeah, she was, you know, any kind of fear. Thank so, what, what we're saying is that what that this is the reason why you know uh, women cannot testify. Because not because they, they tend to be you know like more liars than men whatever, it just happens to be that they the, the fear sometimes makes them makes them lie you know, and this is what this is what we see with Sarah Menu. And by the way, this is what the midrash says you know that we find from here that what that even though Kadosh Baruch who created women, you know, with the intention that they should be righteous, but it didn't turn out exactly that way. What does that mean? That they turned out to be liars, right? And also other things besides that as well. But where we learn it turned out to be liars from Sarah Emanuel, right? Things over here. This thing, you know, she lied over here. So you see that well, the women are liars. That's what it says, right? So if that's the case, um, uh, the reason why she lied is because she was afraid. You know. Uh, so what what does that mean? That if Sarah Emanuel was the most righteous woman, you know, prophetess, you know, uh, we say right that she was even on a higher level than Abraham Avinu in prophecy. That's what the Chazal say, right? But still, she's a woman. You know, woman is a woman. So what does that mean? That even though she was on a very high spiritual level, uh, somewhat higher than even her husband, but when it comes to fear, woman is a woman. You know, that's that's the way it is. So that's the reason why uh, we uh, we don't believe them in court. Mm-hmm. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's go on. So now what happens is that the Chumashamanashim that they finished their first job, right? Which was what? To, to tell the Sarah Emanuel this news, right? We're going to give you a child. Very nice, beautiful. Job is over. Once they finish the job, right away, that's it. Now they're going to their next job. They're not hanging around there, you know, to have a good time, to finish the party, right? To, you know, until, until 3 o'clock in the morning. They have their next job to do, you know, next, next uh, on, on the list. So what happened was that now, because one of the angels already did their job to tell Sarah Emanuel this news, he already left this angel. So there was only two left now. Mm-hmm. One went home. That's it. Job is finished, right? Mission accomplished, as they say, right? So the, he, he went home. So but now what happens is that uh, two of them are left over. And they are the ones who are now right, to, to, to do the job with Sdom. One to destroy overturned Sdom, and the other one to save Lot, right? So now there, there starts to be a new, uh, new agenda over here, right, on, on the table. Which is what? It says, Abraham uh, So now Hashem starts to write, uh, to, to, to deliberate on something. He, he, you know, he starts to ask this question, ponder. He says, Should I hide from Abraham Avinu this issue about Saddam? That I'm coming now to destroy that area? So, you know, he, he's trying to like figure out what's the best way to do this. So he says, I can't hide this from him. There's no way I can hide this fact from Avram Avinu. Why? What's the reason why? What does that have to do with Avram? Avram doesn't live in Sodom. So what's it, what did say? What's it his business, you know, that uh, he should destroy it or not destroy it? You have to do what you have to do. Your God, you know, it's your decision. What does it have to do with him? So the answer is because Akadash Baruch Hu, right, promised Avram Avinu that he's going to give him to Israel. Yeah, all of Eretz Israel is going to be his. So that includes also Sodom Baal and Moran. It's also in Eretz Israel, you know what I mean? It's in the south, 
right? All the way down to the end of the Dead Sea, right? Uh, that's also part of Eretz Israel. Now it's part of Eretz Israel. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. So what happens is that, you know, uh, so Hashem says like this, you know, this guy, I gave him this land. He's the father of this land, you know. He's the owner of the land. <laughs> so I can't really do anything now without asking him, you know, taking advice from him what to do over there. You know, I have to, I have, I have to inform him about this. It's his property, you know. It's like you can't go change somebody's property without telling them what you're doing. So that's exactly why uh, he went now to ask Avraham Avinu, you know, not really to ask. It doesn't really mean now he's asking him what to do. But what he's telling him is, I'm going I'm to inform you. And also giving him a chance, you know, to put in his input, right? To say something about it, to comment on it, to see, you know, what he's going to say about that, what he thinks about it. Is it fair? It's not fair. It's just, it's just, it's not just... Whatever, whatever, whatever it is, you know, he wants to know what, uh, what, what, what he thinks about it. So he tells him like this. He says, uh, So he says, also, I know that he's going to pass a tradition down in his family, right? Giving them the Torah, the, the laws of the Torah, and so forth, so on. Meaning what? That his family is going to be righteous. They're going to be the, he's going to be the father of Am Yisrael. And therefore, I have a really moral obligation to ask him, you know, or to consult with him about this, to, to notify him. So it says, So it says, right now, Hashem says, you know what, I'm going to go down there and to see what's really going on there in stone. Mm-hmm. Meaning what, do they really deserve to be destroyed? I'm going to take one more, one more look at the situation over there. Uh, so what, what does this all mean, by the way? Does Hashem need to go down there to see? He can see also from up there, you know. What does he have to go down there for, you know? What's, what's the whole story over here? So they say stories like this, right? That there was a certain event that occurred in Sdom at that time, which, you know, was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was like something which made the situation unbearable anymore. Mm-hmm. Meaning what? That the people of Sdom were, were very wicked as it was. But they did something this time, you know, which was very, very wicked, very cruel. It was a very, very cruel act. And it brought a very big complaint to Shemaim about them. What, what was the story? They say, right, that uh, we spoke about this before. I don't know if you were here, but uh, we, we said, right, that um, uh, what happened was that they had these rules in Sodom uh, regarding the property over there. They didn't want their property to be used by, you know, foreigners who came in, right, immigrants, you know, who come in there, right? Now we have this... Uh, Right, discussion, right, about immigration and so forth and so on. It's a very big discussion. By the way, you should, they should look at this story, you know, to learn something from here. I think there is something to learn about this situation, about the immigration, you know, situation. Because this really tells you right, that there's also, like, a person can be just, you know, too cool about immigration. You know, to say, you know, nobody can come in here and we don't want anybody, you know, and uh, because they're going to use up our wealth, they're going to use up our, our resources and so forth. Just like the, some people are saying, you know what I'm saying? It, it's, you know, sometimes a person can get a little bit too cool when it comes to these things. A person has to understand, you know, that when people come to America, they come because they're, you know, they're destitute. They have a difficult time where they are. Just like we, you know, also came nobody because came of communism, right? They don't come just for fun. If someone you know? leaves there, nobody like exactly. From Norway, so, nobody comes right. There. So we were also a part of that story. You know, yeah. we left because of communism. We had a very difficult time over there. You left because of the war. There was a war over there. So I'm saying we're talking about you know we had a very difficult situation. You know, we didn't just leave for fun for some kind of a you know excursion. It wasn't some kind of a that's not what it was. So you know, a person has to understand that. So what happened was that in Sodom they had just the opposite attitude. You know, which was what that we don't want any guests over here. We don't want anybody visiting over here. We don't want anybody coming to live here. Somebody new. We don't want that. They didn't want it. Why? Because the economic situation was very, very good there. It was like paradise over there, you know? Green, beautiful, you know, just the most gorgeous paradise. Like, you know, paradise on this world. And that's the way it was. So everything was beautiful and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the farming was beautiful and the, uh, the landscape was beautiful and everything was beautiful. So they had the most perfect life, these people. And they didn't want somebody coming in and taking their resources, you know, the, these kinds of things. So they had all kinds of rules about not taking in guests and so forth and so on. So one of the rules was that if somebody comes, right, to, to, to pass by there, not allowed to give him tzedakah, not allowed to give him uh, right, uh, any charity, uh, things like that, gifts, all kinds of things like that. So what happened was, they say that there was one young girl, you know, who, like a little kid. 
and she decided to do something like that, you know, to be nice to somebody who came in there. And because of that, they heard about it, you know, the people's dumb, and they, they killed her in a very cruel manner. What they did was that they put, like, honey all over her body, right? And they put her up, like, you know, on the... Uh, to, to hang her like that, and then they came right and ate her, the, uh, oh. right, the, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So because of that, when, once they saw, right, when Kadosh Baruch Hu saw this, you know, thing that they did, such a cruel act like that, to kill this young girl like that, such a cruel manner, you know, to be eaten, to be eaten, eaten alive. Can you imagine such a thing like this? Hung and eat, eaten alive. So, uh, once HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw that, he said, you know what, I'm going to go down there. What does that mean? It doesn't have to mean that he has to go down there. What, what, he meant, what he meant to say was, I'm going to understand what happened there, you know, this, this whole uh, you know, uh, episode. I have to go and see you know, exactly what it was and have to judge that. Because if we can judge them in a favorable manner, so we'll, you know, we'll give them some suffering, and they'll, maybe they'll do tshuva, you know, and then they won't have to be destroyed. But if we see that it's really like we think it was, it's that bad, you know, once we judge the whole thing, you know, we have to judge it. So once we judge it and see if it was really that bad as it really seems, at first impression, so then we're going to destroy this place because, you know, I mean, a place like this who does, who does this kind of cruel, you know, treatment to their, to their, you know, to their citizens and also to the guests that come there and so forth and so on. You know, there was many other stories, by the way, that they had all kinds of cruelty that they did over there to the guests. They used to torture them, all kinds of, I mean, you know, the situation was very, very bad. So uh, they used to also rape them. There was rape, torture, all kinds of things. As we're going to see later on also, there was a rape that they did. So that's exactly what, what happened over here. So now, right, comes Hashem and tells, right, the, the, the Malachim, the angels, tell, 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 tell Ram Aminu, you know what, we're going to destroy this town. You know, mm-hmm. so this whole camp, by the way, it wasn't one town. There was like five towns there. It was a whole like metropolis there, you know, like a whole big metropolis. Huge you know, uh, population there. So, uh, because of that, they ask him now, you know, they, they tell him, you know, so we're going to destroy it. So, Avram Avinu, right away, once he hears that, he starts to complain a little bit, right? To Hashem. What does that mean? By Gash Avram, by Yomar, half he spit Sadiqim Rasha. So he says, but wait a second, he says, well, you're going to destroy the whole, this whole metropolis? Sdom and Amora, Almat Suim, right? So are all these places. You destroy all these towns? But wait a second, you know, but there must be some righteous people there. You're going to destroy them too? How is it like that? What, you're going to destroy the righteous and the wicked together? That's what he complains to Hashem, he says, right? You know? How is it right? what, you want to kill them together? The, the, but the righteous don't deserve to die. So what he wanted to say was that what? That maybe if we have some righteous people there, right, a decent number of righteous people, so in their merit, the whole town can be saved as well. That was his, you know, he tried to make an argument like that in front of Hashem. And by the way, this is just the opposite of what we said, right? That Noah didn't do this with Hashem, right? He didn't try to save a generation. And because of that, he's blamed for that, right? That he didn't really do enough, you know, to, to plead on their behalf, right? And to save them, to, to make care of them. He didn't do that, that kind of work. But we see right now that Abraham, right, uh, uh, did a tikkun, right, the rectification for that, uh, for that uh, indiscretion of Noah, right, they didn't do that, Abraham Avinu was just the opposite, right, he came in like a lion, you know, coming over here, trying to defend them, you know, to get them saved, to get them up the hook, and that's what a tzaddik is supposed to do, by the way, a tzaddik is not supposed to say, you know, when Hashem tells him, listen, I want to destroy everybody, you know, oh yeah, go, go ahead, they deserve it, you know, <laughs> that's not what you're there for, you know, Hashem wants you to save them, to pray for them, to, right, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, to say some say some good things about them, right? Some words of, uh, of defense, to be the defense, defense attorney. So you come here and tell, telling me, oh, you know, just, yeah, let, let, okay, destroy, do whatever you want, you know? You know what you're doing. <laughs> not supposed to say like that, Shem, like that. You should say, try to save them, maybe there's Sadiqim there, maybe there's a way we can, we can, we can save them, some kind, we can find some kind of merit there, whatever it is. So that's, that's what exactly what he did. So he started, right, with 50 people, maybe there's 50 people there, we, then we then went down to 40, then to 30, then to 20, and to 10, right? So the thing was that, uh, they, in the end, he got Hashem down to 10, right? There's, you know, the old, the old Minyan, right? We just talked about that, you know, over here, the Minyan, right? So the Minyan is like, we have a Minyan of Tzadikim, that makes already, you know, uh, the town, you know, worthwhile of saving sometimes. That's what it is. So what they did was that they counted up, right, the whole Minyan over there, and they didn't get to 10. This was the thing, you know? They only had like nine. Who was that, by the way? They had Lot and his wives, Right? And his wife, I'm sorry, two, two people, right? And they had his daughters and his son in laws. You know? So that was it. So they didn't come to 10. They didn't have Minyan with, with all those people. 
So what happened was that now they realized, right, there's nothing you can do anymore. Abraham Avinu did the best he could. He tried to get, you know, the best deal that he could possibly get, but it didn't go, right? Uh, just didn't, didn't, didn't go. They couldn't find 10. And by the way, there was also another option, which was what? To combine Hashem, you know, to say, you'll be the 10th, you know, the, you'll be the 10th. You're also there, you're everywhere. So since you're everywhere, you'll be the 10th. But it says in Rashi over here, by the way, that he didn't try that. He didn't even try that. It's because he already knew from before. He tried that before. When he started first to, 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 to you know, to uh, intercede on their behalf, he tried to also to, 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 to do that trick, right? That Hashem should be to combine with them. But since he saw that it didn't work before, so he didn't try this time to make Hashem the 10th. The tenth man, as they right, as as if to say, so he didn't try that this time. So when he knew right that there was the minyan, he knew there was no chance. And by the way, where did he know that there was no chance if there's less than a minyan? He knew that from the mabu, from from the from the uh, from the from the from, the, uh, from the, uh, the the flood of Noah, right? Why? Because over there there was eight only, right? They didn't they didn't have. So therefore, since he, he saw right that they didn't have uh, minyan, so he didn't try to do any less than that because he knew it wasn't going to work. So therefore, he gave up. That was it, and uh, this is why now, right? The only the only solution was to destroy the city, right? But that's that's the way it was.